Hi, everyone, and welcome. I'm Danny Lichtenfeld, director of the Brattleboro Museum. It's my pleasure to be your host for tonight's conversation between curator Mara Williams and artist Anna Shulite Haber, whose work is on view here at the museum as part of the exhibit, All Flowers Keep the Light. Mara, Anna, and I, as you can see, are here at the museum with Anna's work on the walls behind us. We feel like we're getting close to being able to have an audience actually in the space with us in person. We're all fully vaccinated, but we're not quite ready for that next step yet. So we appreciate you tuning in via Zoom or Facebook Live. In just a moment, I'm gonna turn the floor over to Mara and Anna. If you listen carefully, you're gonna hear a train go by the museum too. Uh, I, I'm gonna be listening in on their conversation just like you. And I will also be monitoring the Q&A and the chat on Zoom and on Facebook Live. So, so if you have questions or comments as the conversation's unfolding, please type them in and I'll, I'll pass them along. I'll interject in the conversation and we'll take your questions and comments that way. Normally we save those for the end, but we're trying something different this time. So we'll see how that works. Um, in any case, if you'd like to join the conversation at any point, we would love to hear from you. I'm also planning to share some images of Anna's work as Mara and Anna are talking. Uh, that requires a little bit of technical wizardry that um, I might or might not manage to pull off. So we'll see. All right, uh, before I turn things over to Mara and Anna, I'd just like to tell you a bit about Anna. Originally from Mainz, Germany, Anna Schuleit Haber graduated from the Northfield Mount Hermann School, earned an undergraduate degree in painting from the Rhode Island School of Design and a graduate degree in creative writing and book arts from Dartmouth College. She served as a fellow at the Radcliffe Institute for Advanced Studies at Harvard. And in 2006, she received the MacArthur Genius Award in recognition of the conceptual clarity, compassion, and beauty of her work. Anna's innovative artistic practice encompasses a combination of painting, drawing, installation art, architecture, and time-based media. The work you see on the walls behind me consists of large format photographs and a film of Anna's installation entitled Bloom, for which she filled the abandoned Massachusetts Mental Health Center with thousands of potted plants and live sod just prior to its demolition. The work spanned more than 120,000 square feet, including corridors, offices, and a swimming pool. This is not the first time the Brattleboro Museum has exhibited Anna's work. That happened in 2001, her first solo museum show titled When at Last, which Art New England described as a complex and completely compelling work that evokes the soon to be demolished Northampton State Hospital. I'm so delighted that Anna's here with us tonight and that Mara is here as well. And we're all in the same space in person. So I'm gonna turn it over to the two of them now uh, I will chime in if there are audience questions or comments, or maybe if I have any myself, um, take it away, Anna and Mara, and thank you. Thank you, thank you, Danny. Well, Anna, 20 years later, we see each other again. <laughs> Truly. <laughs> it's, um, I followed your work, proud as punch, that you're like, <laughs> oh, I knew her back, but she was a baby. <laughs> um, and your work has, has over the years, continue to grow, amplify certain themes, and then move on to new practices and new, new means of artistic expression, not just topics, but full, completely different means of artistic expression. Um, and that the dynamic of your career is something that uh, is really extraordinary and congratulations on it. But I wanna go back to our beginning, <laughs> which uh, was the invitation to bring part of your work at Northampton State Hospital up and make a site-specific uh, installation for us. And I don't know, Danny, if you can pull up When at Last, which was in our East Gallery in 2001. So it really has been 20 years. <laughs> um, and I'm still at it and you're still at it. So something, something's working. And you, you can tell us if it's actually up on screen. It is. it is, okay, so it's up on screen. So when it last came out of the Northampton project, but could, would you first go back to the beginning and talk about why that particular mental health hospital and then why mental health for at least a period of time 
was something that you delved into in a su significant and substantive way. Sure. Um, well, I'm so glad to be here uh, and to see you um, again. And time has just been uh, an amazing enigma in many ways, being so rich and also have passed so quickly. Um, I was a student at North Mount Hermann School uh, and I was 16 and I took a walk with friends and we went across um, the campus of the old North Hampton State Hospital and it was deeply ingrained in in my memory of America in many ways. <laughs> so it was the first year I was ever in this country where I wanted to go since I was 12. Um, and once I was finally here, it took me four years of campaigning with my parents to let me go. But finally, here I am. I ended up at the most desolate, um, forgotten place I'd ever seen and felt and walked. And um, I, I said to myself, who is doing anything about this? Now I come from a country that is obsessed with its own history and its history um, analysis, really Germany, and um, for good reasons. And um, I came here and I thought, who, who knows anything about this place? And I found my way into, into the stories of North Amsterdam Hospital through word of mouth. People said, oh, she's very interested in this hospital. Um, let's let's have her meet so-and-so and I would meet a person and they would tell me more and connect me to more people. So it was a really pedestrian way to find out about this history. And I felt like I was the historian. Uh, I, was, I was making my way um, across this landscape that hadn't been charted in a way. Um, and of course it has been, and it has been incredible um, sociology written about it and his, historical um, uh, research as well, of course, but it was, it was not easy to find. Um, so here you're making your way through this place that is a fascination. How do you then take fascination and oral histories that you've collected and bring it to life as an aesthetic object? Hmm. Well, I wasn't trying to do an aesthetic, create an aesthetic object, not even an aesthetic moment, really. So I was at RISD, I studied painting. Um, thanks to NMH, really North Vietnam Herman School, they sent me there through uh, recommendations. They said, you have to go to RISD. I was so happy to be at RISD. And in painting, I was very happy because that was my, my, um, my natural way of thinking on the page was to, to think through um, quiet media, drawing, painting, um, ink. Um, and I realized that what I was interested in though, sociologically wise, uh, people wise, the stories that haunted me, was not graspable mm -hmm. through the medium but that now I was studying. So I said, how, how, can I com how, how can I approach the site itself mm -hmm. and not just paint it and create a reduction of it? Um, so you approached it and <laughs> you needed a fleet of people to help you approach it. The first project um, was about 75 volunteers. Okay, that's habeas corpus, habeas corpus. Danny. Okay. Which is antecedent to our project. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's up on okay. the screen. Now. So it was a sound installation. Um, it was the first project that followed my thesis at RISD, graduating from RISD, four years at art school. And I was doing a, I was creating a project with a medium I had not studied. <laughs> I hadn't studied installation and I hadn't studied sound. I am a lover of music, um, but I, I had no guidance really in creating this project. It was a vision. I, I envisioned creating a sound body out of this building, uh, using the hollows of the building, like the hollows inside an instrument. Um, so for that, I needed, I wanted to use the entire building that I knew, I didn't know how to do it. Um, but I used um, a lot of help. I needed a lot of help and got a lot of help from the community in and beyond Northampton. And lots of people um, joined the project and helped to literally pull cable through the building mm -hmm. and to make it sound on one day, November 18th, 2000, um, and then let it go. And the piece of music we used was Johann Sebastian Bach's Magnificat, mm -hmm. which was a musical memory from when I was a teenager. And I worked as an usher at a classical music festival. And I had heard it sung and performed right. so hauntingly beautiful. So I remembered that piece of music. And so it wasn't a question in my mind that that was going to be the piece. 
So you've moved into installation-based work with a fleet of volunteers, and you've moved um, through sound. You came back out of the project and, and did an installation-based piece with chips of paint, um, detritus from the, you know, from the hospital. And it, I remember the room that you created for us was both antiseptic and decay, but it, it had this feeling that the spirits that had walked through that hospital, what, whether they were patients or orderlies or cafeteria workers or doctors and nurses, that, that some sort of that hallowed space had moved into our gallery. It was really mm -hmm. quite a profound experience to be in that room and to learn about this hospital. But the, at that point, you actually made an installation piece you know, out of materials, not sound. But then you took at another mental health facility in downtown Boston, you were asked to be an artist in residence and right before um, mass mental as we all grew up in Massachusetts calling it, um, you brought Bloom, the piece that we have here, um, blow ups behind us, the piece of film, the documentary film that was made around it. Um, and then how, th I mean, this truly became a full visual walk through, walk in massive installation. Uh, well, the first project, a habeas corpus was from the building sounding out. Mm -hmm. And the second project, um, Bloom, the second large scale project, not the installation I was allowed to create here in the museum, but the la second large scale public piece I did, Bloom, was um, drawing people in. Mm -hmm. So I was allowed to work with the idea of an inviting of the public to the inside of the building. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> so they're, they're, they, they needed each other to be completed because I was, I was, it was both projects concern those spaces, but each is so different. Northampton is 1856 and um, the Massachusetts Mental Health Center is 1910. So um, very different eras in psych, psych, psychiatry mm -hmm. and its message to the public, which is one is we're, we are here for reform up on the hill, mm -hmm. the scary hilltop. Um, and beautiful, beautiful, scary hilltop. And, and Massachusetts Mental Health Center was created in the heart of the city, completely new concept. So I was trying to play with that and, and bring people in. So talk about hallowed ground a bit. When you walk into these spaces and, and uh, haunted, not in the sense that, that it's Halloween, but haunted in the sense that hundreds, if not thousands of lives pass through there. And, and you, a life where mental health is involved is, is fragile um, and often hidden away. And, and, and when you walk in those halls, what's the energy level that, that you feel in your body when you're walking sacred ground? Well, locked institutions have a locked energy. And the locked energy um, remains when the buildings close. So if you're sensitive to that sort of thing, not everyone is, I'm deeply sensitive to the energy of a space, mm -hmm. I'm spatial, um, it speaks to me. And all I needed to do in both cases was, was to allow that to speak for itself in many ways, not to really truly superimpose. Although you could say 20,000 flowers in bloom are major superimposition. <laughs> But I, in that sense, I was, I was allowing the, the lateral spaces to speak mm -hmm. and to smell um, and uh, to have, and to open windows. That was, that was a major- We well, were also uh, reanimating a space. Yeah. Um, the idea for this project is um, that I had in the meantime, between those two projects, been a resident artist at Westboro State Hospital, which was still open and operating. And I saw myself um, as a non-paid volunteer art therapy intern. <laughs> um, I saw that people did not receive as you do in other hospitals and treatment centers, flowers. The very essence of a caring gesture that we all receive when we're sick, very sick or give birth. Mm -hmm. um, and so why, is, why isn't that? Why, why do we not, why is that that we don't get flowers? Why, um, why are, why do people not bring flowers to psychiatry? Well, first of all, there's not many visitors who come mm -hmm. to these hospitals. And second is um, that 
often family members think that someone is psychiatrically ailing, um, is in need of quiet and rest and maybe not something strong, mm -hmm. um, stimulating. And sometimes they think flowers are not allowed, which often, in, oftentimes I asked and, and actually they are allowed. Oh. Um, and then when is the acute moment as in uh, childbirth, when you give flowers, you know, the week of the birth of the mm -hmm. child, when is the acute moment of giving this gesture to the patient? So I added up all the flowers that had been missing that hadn't been given in, inside of these spaces that I assumed if one, one patient had, re had received at least one flower uh, through the history of the institution, we would have to have at least 28,000. Wow. wow. Now, what happened to the flowers afterwards, just in case we have any concerns about that? So the, the flowers were not cut, so they wouldn't be wasted. And they were also given on to people who are um, behind bars. So we um, brought them personally uh, the, the project was open for four days, but for four weeks following the project, we delivered flowers throughout New England to halfway houses, uh, quarterway houses, psychiatric um, units of general hospitals, um, and a few of the general uh, the psychiatric hospitals that are still open, as in Cranston, Rhode Island, where we brought an entire truck, and the the delivery was was anticipated, and we delivered them, and then they were blessed in the chapel. The flowers were blessed in the chapel by the people who are receiving them and, and every patient actually received them because I said on the phone to these people, I said, please make sure this doesn't end up in the staff lounges. Mm -hmm. Wonderful. I'm sure it ends up with the people. So then you went on and you moved out to 400 acres and did a project outside called Landlines. Um, so again, another massive fleet of volunteers and how did you find that land? Were you commissioned to do that project? Did you think up that project on your own? <laughs> so Landlines was a dream, another dream come true. It was a commission by the McDowell Colony and they wanted to do something for the 100th anniversary. Now you know that McDowell as, as the oldest colony in this country um, had always its, as its mission to protect artists from the outside influences and to give them space to create. And to do so, they had to shield them from the, the disturbances of uh, the telephone and and what well, you know uh, the internet and so on so i thought for that day what we want to do is break the rule on a massive scale <laughs> and have the entire forest ringing uh with phone calls coming in <laughs> so for the 100th anniversary we're going to break that rule and um who would be calling i so that was the first idea and the second was who would be calling all those trees because i thought it has to be outdoors and i've always wanted to work with trees so we well, it's 100 years we'd have 100 telephones each one a different telephone model because it was the history of the telephone okay. told through um, through all those uh, models. And then uh, who would be calling on the other end? So who's picking up and who's calling? And I thought it wouldn't be great to connect strangers with each other who've never spoken to one another. Um, and in the dark, there were um, uh, the flashlights that illuminated the tree like a cone of light. And you'd step into it and speak to someone uh, on the other end. Uh, the phone would just be ringing and you'd pick up and say, it's Mara. <laughs> and then on the other end would be Danny from California and calling in. <laughs> and you'd have a conversation that was impromptu and truly spontaneous. And sometimes we, we saw the record of the, all the calls mm -hmm. after the project was over because it was sponsored by Verizon. And Verizon gave us the entire log of all the calls that were made. And some, the longest call was 21 minutes between strangers and the shortest was 20 seconds. <laughs> <laughs> and how, how did you get fleets of people to call in? That, that is a great like logistical how did you curatorial get, question. Like how did you get them all to yeah. call in? I mean, I assume the artist of McDowell and people who live in the colony or were visiting the colony would find a tree and pick up a phone. But how did you get people to call into right. McDowell? And to call them solid, not to have long gaps. So my idea was to, to publish it in the New York Times and have, give out the number. It was a 1-800 number. And everyone said that that's going to overwhelm the system. We're going to break it. Um, that was probably true. <laughs> It's always good to have curators. Um, and then the second idea was to give it to 8,000 people. And those 8,000 people were the former fellows who'd all been, all around the world had been at that uh, colony. So those called in to say happy birthday, McDowell. So sweet. 
<laughs> my friend Tom Putnam was the president at the time. I remember Tom dearly. Yes. Tom, he was a wonderful. wonderful advocate for making the strangest and most impossible thing possible. That, that's that's <laughs> Tom, marvelous man. So now we have another project that you did called Just a Rumor. So do you want to tell our our visitors on Zoom and yeah. Facebook? <laughs> Uh, Danny, do you have a picture of that? Yeah. So Just a Rumor was a commission by um, the, what's now called the University Museum of Contemporary Art at, at U UMass yes. Amherst. Um, and they asked me to create something large scale, interactive, immersive, strange, hopefully um, uh, engaging. Mm -hmm. And um, they said, but it has to be outdoors. It can't be in our spaces because we're getting a new air conditioning system, I think it was. <laughs> so I said, wonderful. Let me take a look at your campus. I found an old bench and the bench was at a pond site, right on the side of the pond. And then when you sat there, you looked at a concrete wall of the Fine Arts Center. I said, well, here's the painter in me. I'd love to take that concrete wall. I went to my curator, I said, may I have that concrete wall? And she said, to do what? And I said, just say yes or no. And <laughs> she said, yes. And I said, okay, so it's a massive concrete wall. I ended up painting a 40 by 45 foot painting on the side of the wall that was an upside down face of a farmer that I found in the archives because UMass Amherst used to be an agricultural yeah, college. Absolutely. And Stockbridge um, School of Agriculture. That's what it started yeah. as. So I found that I found a wonderful face. I needed a face that's um, recess, has recess uh, shadows and uh, interesting features. He had massive ears and looked really wonderful, um, wonderful face. And I but I, I abstracted it further by doing a hundred studies or so of faces and then turned it upside down on the wall and had it reflect in the, in the water and the only right side up in the water. So that when you, so in order to even know what on earth I was doing, which was many people walking by um, was the question, what, what are you doing? Are you drawing cupcakes? And I said, just come to my opening. So for the opening, we we went to that bench and we had a tent set up and um, someone, um, there were ducks in the water who were going to be my collaborators by swimming through and wiping out my, my painting in the water. And someone brought bread so that they would just for the opening, leave the water surface intact and be on the other side of the pond. <laughs> and so they, they fed them bread on the other side. And then we had the face in the water reflected. And I didn't know until the night I started working on the, on the, on the lift, if it was really going to travel mm -hmm. the way a tree is upside down in the water. It worked out. So I was so excited because now that was the merging of my media. Of, Absolutely. Of painting and science specificity. So. so now you come to the theater lover in me. The next slide that we have is from New York, um, New York Live Arts. And you figured out how to merge your, your actual drawing, the art practice that, that you studied and have committed to since Northfield Mount Cameron, but at, at RISD. And yet like, you turned it into a performance and you, you upped the scale incredibly. So why don't you talk about how you, first off, found that you could do that, how you found the technical mastery and then the performance itself. So uh, there was a dancer, Ivy Baldwin Dance, a dance group, um, and they approached me and wanted to do a set design with me. And I created a set design that was a passive, calm, static painting. And then came this opportunity to do another, another set design for them. And I said, you know, the last one was too static for my taste. I wanted it to be more live. Um, and I'd always wanted to work with a drawn line, the line that is live, that doesn't live past its moment. Mm -hmm. And so I had at, in my studio done all these tests with a projector drawing on tablets uh, and projecting into the space. And um, so in this, in, at New York Live Arts, we were able to collaborate together so that I was inserting my drawings directly onto the dancers um, as the they moment. were moving, but also erasing parts um, and all of it. Um, and coming back at other times. So it, it was uh, uh, it was a 10 week rehearsal in which I was um, a, li a live member of the dancers, except that I, fortunately I wasn't on stage. I was, I was in the dark uh, way up in the back and I loved it. I loved it. And I, I, I created a similar project last year in Denmark um, for which we rehearsed in a, in a similar way. And I was able to do a set design there um, that ended up not being as interactive, interactive because of the pandemic. I couldn't go in oh. person. I couldn't do that, but we came close to it. And, and I, I hope to do it again. 
Okay, great. I have a whole fleet of dancers I'm going to introduce you to <laughs> now because I, I just love that. Um, I, I just want to go over one more big public project that you did before we start talking about process and, and, um, and where, what, what, gen, what are the generative moments in your life that get you to these larger projects that you're doing. And so, um, Danny, I think, um, do you have a few pictures of the alphabet project where you took the first page of the two Fitchburg newspapers and created the front page every day? It was an NEA Our Town grant, which requires the artists to uh, work with the Main Street. Uh, so I sat on Main Street in Fitchburg and I looked around and I realized my goodness, they have a daily newspaper here. Mm -hmm. And I've always loved newspapers and I love trains. One day I would like to do a project with a train. A train just went by as we started. Um, Danny can set you up with that. <laughs> and so it was, um, the, it was a dream come true to work with a newspaper. I went to the newspaper. I told my curator, please, please connect me to the man who runs the editor in chief, um, Charles St. Amand. And uh, we, you, this is a lucky moment when you connect mm -hmm. because it could just, as well be the opposite mm -hmm. and he liked the idea of me embedding myself in the newsroom and curating the front page from um uh in both design and content the front page he said can you take page three and i said no it, it, no one will pay attention to this project it will only be interesting if i get the actual front page and we did for um all letters of the alphabet which was our series we needed a sequence and we needed one that opens and ends so we created the 26 letters of the alphabet created by 26 world-class um, uh, graphic designers mm -hmm. from typographers. And each one created a different letter. So we uh, had about 14,000 readership per day. And it went up during that time. Terrific. And, um, We'd like to hear that. has <laughs> since lost its, um, its print edition. It's gone digital as all newspapers are. We're, we're still holding on because we're a print town. So we're still holding on. It's so wonderful to have still the actual, the actual um, paper in your hands. So these wonderful, you know, alphabet uh, alphabet books are a, a whole thing in and of themselves. Did they like reduce and bind them so that you could have these? I mean, they are splendid. Nothing has been done yet. That's still to be done. Okay. It would be marvelous. I, I, I think love so too. typography. Be, be I wonderful. love typography. Um, so Danny, have we popped up any questions on any installation-based work that you wanted to let us know about? No, I think people are <clears throat> totally enthralled and just taking this all in <laughs> at the moment. But I'll, I'll encourage everyone, uh, once again, feel free to chime in with your questions and comments. I think we've trained our Zoom audience pretty well to waiting until the end. Okay. And then, and then <laughs> so doing Q and A, or else this might just be a, a start stacking those Zoom questions audience. up. <laughs> well, what I it's the part of your practice I know very little about is your paintings, and I know you do some very large, significant painterly abstractions. Uh, and, and I'm dying to get into your studio now that the pandemic is over and really dig into those because paint is just marvelous. I just love it. Um, but so how do, how do you, I mean, you've had it, it incredibly, I mean, it's a 20 year history of significant conceptual mm -hmm. installation based and performative based um, art projects that take a, they, a lot of time, they're durational, massive amount of work and um, logistical expertise. What are the quiet times like? And then how did the paintings come out of those quiet times? Well, all of the projects that I've described have had moments when they almost truly fell apart in the midst of it. Um, they were crises because they were so difficult. Mm -hmm. um, so, the, so painting to me is my bedrock. I, this is what I do um, every single day uh, when I, and I, I'm not even good at logistics. Um, <laughs> I can't even run big teams of people very well the way other people do. Um, I, I think I, I can motivate them, uh, but I, I love, to just be with the work in my studio. I love my studio and I love um, being in uh, uh, by myself and, um, and refueling. 
And I love the medium of painting and I like its resistance to, uh, to all things digital. Mm -hmm. Of course, we can photograph them and zoom in and we can, we can even Bitcoin them. <laughs> but we, you know, here, I, I, I'm currently working on a piece um, that's close to done, maybe mm -hmm. 75, 80, probably 85 percent done for a, a, a wonderful couple in Florida. Um, that is uh, building a, an incredible house, actually clad in Vermont slate. Um, and um, it's, it's a piece that's 24 feet wide. Um, and it's, uh, it's asking me to, to truly think of an entire context, an architectural context, mm -hmm. which is what I love to do, right? So it's, uh, it's my media coming together, the, the seclusion, the, the, the calm and the quiet away from people, and then the reaching out and the merging with the public realm, in that case, a wonderful domestic space. Okay, well, we have a question, Danny, just motion to me. Yeah, so uh, Anonymous is asking, would you, would you ever consider remounting one of these projects that you've done? Like do, I, I guess perhaps like do the alphabet project again with another newspaper or, or are these really, uh, is that like a photocopy in mm -hmm. your mind? You know, does it lose the magic? Well, the, the ma well, I don't know, yeah, curators can, or anyone else can say that better about the projects, what really works about it, right? From the inside, I can say that it's most appealing and most, um, most sizzling aspect about these projects is that it had so much risk mm -hmm. uh, involved. And if I were to remake something exactly the same way, then I would, I would, um, I would already be rehearsed. Right. Um, so I would do something with a newspaper again, absolutely. Mm -hmm. I would do something with closed institutions or institutions that are closing, um, absolutely. But I will never do them like that again. Yeah. It's not are... a revival of blue. No, 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 no. <laughs> In fact, I think this project, uh, because flowers are such a universal um, icon, mm -hmm. uh, had such a huge audience. It was in the Daily Times of Pakistan the moment it opened. Um, because everyone relates to flowers, why wouldn't you? But in fact, I'm not a flower person. In fact, I had to learn all those names of the flowers <laughs> <laughs> when I was running the project. And it wasn't about flowers, you know, it was about a gesture and about um, a transgression, a healing transgression. That's what I was interested in. And I was using the flowers, but I wasn't promoting the flowers um, or I wasn't even highlighting them. Although of course they are highlights in and of themselves, so. Um, no, I can't do these projects again or habeas corpus. Well, and, and you know, in the theater, you can work with a dance company again, but if, if you're drawing at the moment, even if it's the same dance that was done in Stuttgart that is now being done in, in Berlin, um, the drawing is going to be different. But we, that's actually interesting you mentioned that because when we were on stage rehearsing, I was in the back, I was expected to perform identically like a dancer to the day before and the day before that. And it took a lot of calories out of me. I had to really concentrate because drawing is free, right? Mm -hmm. And especially if it's in the moment it disappears, what's my reference? So my reference was the human body and I used it as a, as a, um, uh, mnemonic device in a way. I remembered what I had to do by responding directly to how, how it moved the body of the dancer. And that was incredible. It burned extra, extra calories um, <laughs> for me. <laughs> and I like the challenge. I, I like to be challenged um, in, in having to get past my comfort zone. And that was completely out of my comfort zone because I wanted not to endanger the entire choreography. I, had to, I, I was just a team player and I loved that. I loved it. Well, I was a stage manager in dance and calling a show, like music on, music off, lights do this, based on a movement Incredible. is a lot harder than cueing a script. You know, yeah, when, yeah. when Lear says this, we bring the lights to half is a little bit different than a dancer's flipping around through there. And as they swoop, the sound has to go on. Yeah or you have to go to blackout while they're in the middle of a leap because that's what the choreographer yeah. wanted. And yeah. it's, it's a lot harder than a scripted piece. So um, I'd love to see you work on it. Thank again. you. I'm gonna find I, some I, more I choreographers really so. for you. I really <laughs> hope so. It was a, it was a, so when you're painting a 24 foot canvas, which would be the length of this wall, yes. exactly, you know, and, and one presumes that the piece is at least 10 feet high. It's seven, it's seven by 24. Seven by yeah. 24. Are you sketching or are you, are you improvising through the whole thing until it's done? 
or what's your the original your time frame for this piece was a year and then it expanded because of the pandemic and um, some other delays and uh, and so I was able to sort of really relax towards the middle and the end mm -hmm. now um, and letting it really take its shape slowly like something opening slowly but in the beginning I was sketching a lot and I took it with me actually before I stretched it on the wall into the forest and I worked on the ground in the forest directly on it using all sorts of references for example I used um, uh, I used uh, saddles I um, I love uh, tack, tack and horses and I use saddles in the early phases of the piece um, and I trace them so it would be one to one scale to the human body mm -hmm. um, and then also made them disappear again. So I had direct traces of objects in there that are buried in the, in the base of the piece. Um, but then much of the abstraction that happened came through um, layering um, glazes. So I did a lot of glazing. Um, when do you ship this painting out so I can go see it? This painting has been shipped and is waiting to be installed. And then once it's installed, I'm going to do a residency in the house um, directly on site. Where in Florida are you? <laughs> it's in Winter And what Park. are the dates? <laughs> <laughs> we, we don't know yet. Oh, we will okay. see. We will Let see. me know because I'll come down. But I'll document it. But it will be wonderful because I can I put up a mattress next to the bed, uh, next a uh, little mattress next to the painting and, and be with it um, directly for maybe five to seven days. Wow. and uh, be with it around the clock that's my that's my that's my vision for it we'll see how the details documented i yes. have to see this i think we have another question so um this is a question that i have on behalf of a young artist who i was talking with earlier today telling her about your work and that we're going to have this conversation tonight and she's primarily a painter mm -hmm. and i was describing your work and it was just like completely mystifying to her to try to understand how you proactively pursue these massive, um, complex, community-engaged installation-type projects with hundreds of participants of all different types. Is that something that you can, that you proactively make happen? Or is it like somebody has a, gets an Our Town grant and they know you've done, mm -hmm. you know, you have a reputation and you're known for this kind of work, so then they contact you? How, how does that come together? It's, it's a mixture of both, really. The very first project, KBS Corpus, was a self commission. I, I was, I only there was only resistance. There was no no one who helped in the early years, and it took four and a half years to create um, 20, 20 something minutes, thirty minutes of a project. Um, and that was that was a vision I had that I held on to. Every single day, I woke up and I had the had the sheets to hear, and I said, "Am I still seeing this?" <laughs> And then if I answered yes, I would go through my day and try, mm -hmm. try to convince politicians to give me the permissions and funding, which was impossible for something that doesn't last. Um, but later it was curators who contacted me and said, would you like to work with this and this and this? So it's a mixture of both, but in each you have to preserve your path through the material. Even if it's not self-commissioned, you want to make it feel as if you have full license to play, right? That's mm -hmm. the word play before you settle. You want to play and create that lightness and have that lightness of the creative process before you settle and etch it in, in stone. So in even these massive projects, do you sketch out, do you, do you sketch free sketch or? Yes, uh, absolutely. Yeah, I have sketches for everything. Um, and, you know, people want when you try to convince politicians to let you do something they want to see what that would look like but in the sound project um that was impossible to show so i had to say please to someone i had never met can you just do me a favor and follow me into the vision and close your eyes and try to see this and then there were two kinds of people ones who knew johann sebastian bach mm -hmm. and others who did not and i found the the, the former to be um uh, easier to work with because they could fathom that a little bit. And the latter more resistant to my using uh, Baroque music. And once I was in a meeting where uh, someone said to me, well, can we use Pink Floyd instead? <laughs> and that was meant seriously. And of course I did not laugh because I, 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 I had to handle this, but how do I say no? Thank you. We're not going to use Pink Floyd, although the wall fits, you know, you're breaking through the wall. <laughs> but I, let, trust me. And then I would have these moments when I say, trust me on the music choice or trust me 
on the phones all ringing because we have no guarantee they will all ring at mm -hmm. the same time um, throughout this forest canopy, you know, mm -hmm. this canopy of sound that we're trying to, but what if no one calls? You know, I was in these meetings with, with the board of directors and they said, what if no one calls and we're putting a year and a half of our time and effort into creating this project? Um, so I love this though, but, this part. But <laughs> 8,000 former McDowell, you had to have had a lot of phone calls because people who have had the McDowell experience are devoted to the institution. Exactly. So, so. We, we had as far people as far away as Australia call in. It's terrific. Yeah. Terrific. Danny, do we have any other questions? I don't see any at the moment. Okay. Well, um, I'm sure. Let's get, I'll, I'm just going to ask more questions about abstraction and the body. So I'm fascinated. I know that you're, you're, you're a horsewoman, that, that, that riding is a vital part of your life and your daughter's lives. Um, and, and of course, the saddle does fit the human body. So after you've done a tracing, is it, is, is it a pedimento or is it, is it a, a placeholder in some form that will be created that doesn't look like a saddle but has a scale? Is it a... I'm most interested in the, in the scale, actually. So the scale is when it becomes, when things become powerful, can become powerful, because we relate to the scale. When something is right, mm -hmm. we relate to it on a, on a sublingual level, on a subvisual level. It's something very innate. And so um, using, for example, the dimensions of a chair mm -hmm. uh, works very well when you try to speak to the body. As soon as you take a chair out of its dimensions, you create um, interesting dynamics. Mm -hmm. uh, you, you, uh, so when I traced the saddles, I was looking at different craftsmanship. I was actually working with a saddler to take one apart from me. And I traced the actual pieces as if I was making a saddle back on paper. And then I had all the pieces of the saddle and I was using them throughout the piece. And um, in parts, I was pinning them with needles on to see where they are, um, really playing visually and then before settling into actually drawing them onto this expensive mm -hmm. linen that I'm working on this incredible old material mm -hmm. the 500 year old material that um that holds paint so beautifully um and but before I go into that directly with pigment ink um wet media and dry media um I use paper paper cutouts of my own drawings that I blow up and reduce again and blow up again uh from small to big or small big to small so it's patterning. Are it's you patterning a, in a way. A, yeah. Are you a seamstress? No, I, I, yeah, in the most basic sense, sure. Uh, okay. I love to. I love to sew, and I know how a coat is made. But no, I'm not currently sewing. <laughs> but yes, I love patterns. And and as soon as you take a pattern, if you if you know how patterns work in this basic sense of how we dress, and then apply it to how you see a cityscape, um, it's so interesting to to take things apart in your imagination and to spin it, spin them. And to play with them well and your installation based work is happening in in a building and a building if you, if you know architecture at all and what plans and elevations and isometric drawings are you know you're spinning uh 45 degrees this way or or bird's eye this way and so you can see where where you've created volume here but then you've flat patterned it. And then when you, uh, on, on the, the one painting we've talked about, which we haven't seen, so it's very interesting to yeah. me because I'm, I'm seeing the painting in my head, obviously. Um, are you treating the pattern as flat or are you creating volumes? Like, well, you... they become unflat by relating to one another. The moment you do that, you, you, you are imagining space recession and approaches uh, so it works that way and 24 feet is wonderful because i have so much space and it's not intimidating to me it's joyful to have room <laughs> <laughs> so i i mean anything this size for example as a painting is such a frustration because it's a reduction of everything it's a reduction of anything but my hand my hand could fit here mm -hmm. but otherwise it's um it's so frustrating and i remember feeling that at RISD as like oh painting is too small <laughs> Painting is too small a medium for um, what I want to do. I, you, you belong in set design. That's all I can say <laughs> is you belong in set design. <laughs> That's a wonderful world. Any other questions, Danny? 
I don't think so. I'm just stifling all of my questions about the project that could involve the train station and the yeah. train. Well, we'll you we'll have to understand another, that Danny's another, family, another particularly his dad, train fanatics. They go on whole cross country, cross Canada train rides as a family. So you're speaking his language there wonderful. and I'm sure he will cook up something for you. Oh, wonderful. Let's do it. Yeah, let's That's do so that. That's the amazing. Yeah, we've got a hundred year old train that. station here. You I know, and I, I love the speed with which it rolls in and, and uh, it's, it's very present. In the sound. I live three miles from town and I can hear the oh, whistles yeah. at night. It's just marvelous. It's just it marvelous. amazing. I've once ridden that train from New York to Montreal, but I got out here because I was going, I, for some reason, I had left my car somewhere. And I saw the conductor, it was just him and me on that train. <laughs> and I said, conductor, is there a reason why this train even runs? Obviously, you can't run it on my ticket sale because it's 40 bucks or something. And he said, well, sometimes there's more people than just one. <laughs> But Vermont wants to have a train, so here it is. Yeah, we pay for that train. That's oh, right. okay. Yeah, we do. <laughs> we, we do. Not that it's run. In it's the last wonderful. Two years. It's wonderful. Okay. Is there anything else you'd like our audience to know? Well, I mean, in a, in this very special time of the pandemic, um, it's it's been so direly felt that we disconnected from one another, and just to even be in one space like this without a mask is sort of revolutionary, <laughs> radical. It's definitely radical. And I'm so grateful that we can do this and slowly open the doors again. And, um, and for you to uh, take the risk of a live audience is really wonderful. And I'm so glad there was somebody um, and to make that possible. Thank you. You are most welcome. <laughs> and I thank you for the, the joy and the poignancy that you've brought into the life of anyone who's from the small room size installation you've done to these massive projects. And I can't wait to see the studio work. Thank you. Thank you so much. Please come and visit. You. Well, and so wouldn't you know it, now we have questions coming. Okay, well, that's fine. <laughs> that's fine. So, <laughs> so this experiment in doing the questions throughout, I guess we've trained our Zoom audience too well, but we have, we have uh, a few questions that I'd love to pass along. <laughs> Please do. The first one is from Jamie, who says, you've worked on multiple occasions in very different ways within institutions for mental health care. Have you ever worked with the patients within these institutional contexts as artists or thought about the creative acts of patients within these contexts? That's a great question and a very urgent one, I suppose, after talking for 45 minutes. <laughs> um, yes, I have. I was invited to be a visiting artist at Westboro State Hospital um, between the two first, the, the first and the second project. Um, and I was on the units with the patients and I was uh, allowed to create a project that was not um, public, can't be public because of HIPAA, HIPAA laws. Um, and that's how it should be. It should protect the, the privacy of the patients. But yes, I have, and it was life-changing because after that, Bloom came out of that project. So um, I wouldn't have been able to envision Bloom if it hadn't been for working with the patients directly. Wonderful. Um, next question is from Susan who asks, Anna, can you please talk about shoes and feet in your paintings and drawings? <laughs> Well, there was a resistance, my resistance, of course, to want to um, envisioning a human figure painted with that typical um, start of the face and the rest sort of filled in the body. And I thought, what if you start from the bottom up um, and sort of have a, have, a, have a back door to personality because personality is contained in, in all of our endings, our limb endings. And um, I just, it was my way of overcoming, I suppose, the um, intimidation that I felt of the, um, the sanctity of the face. So it was my back door to painting. <laughs> and then I really, I really love um, using that as a, as, a, as a point of departure for abstraction, because mm -hmm. it allows me to tell the story of the figure without making it a portrait, mm -hmm. which is a whole nother realm I've never attempted to do except for just a rumor, I suppose. Well, we do have a, a pile of antique shoes from patients that were, were in Massachusetts that it just settles a little of the people of the hospital into our, 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 our institution. Yeah. As part of the installation here. Um, yeah, which we're not able to get on the camera That's right it, now. Yeah. But, it, it's, but uh, everybody it's should come and visit us if they yeah, haven't already. Absolutely. absolutely. <laughs> yeah. 
Uh, Anna, thank you so much for doing thank this. You. What a joy. Thank, thank you. you for your work. I, um, you're, you're, you've injected our world with some really um, powerful creativity and just wonderment. And I'm so grateful for that. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Mara, thank you as always. You're welcome, Danny. What, what a delightful conversation. Uh, before we sign off here, I just want to let everyone out there know, and I want to thank you all for tuning in tonight as well. Oh, this, this, I'm having a hard time corralling this audience tonight. I think there are more questions coming in. <laughs> this one may be too big for the, uh, uh, for the last second, which is what do you recommend for creative inspiration? Wow. Do you have, do you have a quick, uh, where it doesn't have to be quick, we can, we can continue. You know, I have a, I, I actually, that's wonderful. It's a trigger. Oh, and then there's for, another question coming yeah. in. Okay. Well. So the first one, what do you recommend for creative inspiration yeah. Yeah. is to get off your phones. Oh, because good. phones are yeah. filled with algorithms of how to navigate this world. Mm -hmm. And so to navigate this world, which is um, the beginning of all creativity, I think, um, being here as a citizen who's looking, and John Stilgo at Harvard wrote about this, mm -hmm. just being in a public realm, public space without purpose mm -hmm. um, unsettles everybody. So if you just nowadays, everyone is required to be looking at your phone if you're in a public realm, public space. What if you just go and look? People get nervous. Um, mm -hmm. So that's a, that's a good indicator of the treasure to be found there. Mm -hmm. The treasure of what we're looking for in this on this earth is really uh, requiring us first to um, to disconnect from tools that tell us what what that would be. Yeah. Wonderful. And the second, second that. <laughs> uh, And this this one additional comment is from Martha. A uh, note of gratitude. Martha says, I saw Anna's work a few months ago and drove home to the Adirondacks thinking about and feeling the power of the work. Hmm. Thank you. Oh, thank you. Yeah. Lovely, Martha. Thank you, Martha. Thank you so much. And thank you, everyone. And thank you, the two of you, you, once again. Um, and so as I was beginning to say, I just want to make sure that you all know that a recording of this conversation tonight will be available on the museum's website within a day or two. That's brattleboromuseum.org. So if you know, uh, having tuned in here, uh, if you wanna go back and listen again, or more likely you know somebody else who would really uh, enjoy hearing this conversation, you can share that with them. Uh, while you're there on our website, you can check out the recordings of dozens of other events that we've presented online during this strange and amazing in some ways uh, past year. Um, and if you're in the Brattleboro area and you're interested in an actual in-person non-screen based art experience, uh, come to the museum any Wednesday through Sunday, 10 to four, we're here, we're open, we're still requiring masks and there's plenty of room for social distancing. If you wanna make sure to see Anna's work and the other exhibits that are currently on view, well, you'd better get here within the next two weeks because these are closing on June 13th. Then we'll take a week to change over all our exhibits and, uh, five or six new exhibits will open on Saturday, June 19th with a public opening reception at 5 p.m. Please come join us for that. And lastly, if you enjoyed this event tonight and would like to make a donation to support this type of free programming, we would be very grateful for that. You can also do that at our website, brattleboromuseum.org. I think that does it. Anna, Mara, thank you one more time. Stay safe, everyone. Take good care of yourselves and have a good night. Hope to see you soon. Bye.